this, the largest animal in this area, the brown bear. Here it's called a grizzly. Russian grizzly? Or a Kodiak. A silver tip bear. And it has its Latin name, Ursus Arctus Horribilis. Uh, what's in a name? It's not just bears that have this controversy over the names. With so many common names for the same organism, how do scientists refer to an organism to get around this name mess? Today we're looking for a fish species that we've never seen before. Every dive becomes almost a new adventure that way. That's right. We shoot as much video as we can of every species we come across to anywhere in the world. We then compile them into online identification guides through untamedscience.com and it's this video we use to help us identify new species. Let's go. Underwater, we see an array of beautiful corals and colorful fish. Every one of these animals has a unique classification, grouped by their similarity to each other. For instance, there are many species of fish that we call butterfly fish. Most look fairly similar with yellow, black, and white coloration. They have somewhat similar behaviors too. For example, you always find them swimming over the reef in pairs. They mate for life. But while we're able to identify most fish, some fish we're just not used to seeing. And that's exactly what we found today. You see it in there? That looks cool. Like an eel. There? The thing's kind of yeah, dipping yeah. over. What is it? Um, Most of the time you can identify organisms using field guides, but not always. What if this was the first time this fish had ever been recorded? Well, then we'd need to name it. Today we call the practice of naming and classifying organisms systematics. But giving names to plants and animals started a long time ago with a guy named Linnaeus. In the 1700s, this Swedish doctor decided he'd give plants and animals names and then group the species together based on their similarity to each other. But he didn't just name things randomly, there were rules to keep things organized. He decided that every species should have a two-part name. The first part would be the genus, kind of like your last name, and the second part, the specific epithet, which is kind of like your first name. For example, the scientific name of humans is Homo sapiens. Latin is the language of systematics, so every name has to be Latinized. Today, this system is a nested hierarchy of classification into which all organisms fit. As an example, let's use mammals. All mammals are grouped together in the class Mammalia. They're then divided up into increasingly smaller groups called orders, families, genera, and then species. This all seems easy to understand, but who really decides how an organism today is named and how do they do it? Let's take an unknown fish and go see an expert. So to help us answer some of these questions, we're at the Bishop Museum with Dr. Richard Pyle. Well, my name is Richard Pyle. My PhD is in the study of taxonomy or systematics, which is the study of how, what organisms are out there and how they're related to each other. We operate very much the way a library does, in the sense that people come here, researchers will come here and examine our specimens, just like people go to libraries. So we have all of these specimens. We've got, oh, about 40,000 of these jars in here. And they range in size from little guys like this and stuff that's even much smaller than this to very big things. We have shark jaws, we have, uh, large specimens, we've got sharks, we've got all kinds of things. After we've collected specimens and examined them, 
We search our literature, we search our books, we try to find out whether or not it's a known species. And quite often in the realm where we're working, if we don't recognize it, it's probably a new species, which means nobody's ever seen before. Well, this bank of shells right here is far and away the most valuable part of our entire collection. And the reason for that is these are all of our type specimens. So you see a lot of these have little red ribbons on them. Type specimen, as in holotype? The holotype, oh. right. The red ribbons are the holotypes. So those are the, the name-bearing specimens. So this holotype is, is, as I said, the specimen that bears the name. And we, we basically, we collect it, we examine it very carefully, we count up all of its spines, all of its scales, certain measurements, we get proportions, we describe its color, we take photographs, we take x-rays, we do all these things to sort of get a sense for what this species is. And write it up in a scientific paper, and then we publish it. And once it's published, that's when the new name becomes available for people to use. So now we know how scientists give species a name, let's see if we can give ours a name too. Garden eel right there. There's two of them in that jar. That's the ones. These are the ones, yeah. The reason they're called garden eels is when you're out on the sand on the bottom of the ocean, you see them, they look like a garden of little, you know, just long, thin branches sticking up. And then if you approach them as a diver, they disappear down into the sand and vanish. The group of species isn't completely well known. There's a number of named species, but there's also a number of species that haven't yet been named. So they're still being discovered in this group. So remember, there's lots of new species to be discovered and filmed. And now that we know a little bit about how you name animals, we can get around all the confusion of common names, and we can use the official scientific name. Yeah, in fact, you may have already seen a new species without realizing that it's new to science. And remember, if you want to find a new species, well, maybe you can. Then the best part is that when you find a new species, you get to name it. What would we name it? Robicus fishii. <laughs> So never stop exploring your world. I don't know, what is the name? <laughs>